the phone. A pleasure to welcome back to the uh, the show, uh, professor of history and African American studies at the University of Houston, author of thirty books at least, uh, and his most recent, "The Dawning of the Apocalypse." Roots of Slavery, White Supremacy, and Settler Colonialism and Capitalism in the Long 16th Century. Uh, Professor Gerald Horn, um, welcome back to the program. Thank you for inviting me. Um, so the, the, I, the, w- one of the things, I want to just start a little bit more general, because one of the things that I <clears throat> really enjoy about uh, your work is that it seems like you have uh, pursued a topic and then realized that there is a predicate that is missing. And you have done that um, timeless times to now to where you are back to the um, the mid 1400s. Uh, will you just talk about your perspective on history and that process? And then, you know, just to set the table as to how we can then start to move forward, I guess, in time. Well, I'm trying to understand how so many people from so many parts of the world, myself with roots in Africa, I assume your roots are in Europe, how we all wind up in North America speaking a language, English, that in the 1500s was the language of a minor kingdom on the outskirts of Western Europe. And so in order to answer that question, I've been going back in time. Uh, my previous book was on the 17th century. This book ostensibly is dealing with the 16th century, but actually, in some ways, I'm going back to 1095 and the origins of the, what were called the Crusades. Uh, that is to say, this effort by Western European Christendom to retake what they call the Holy Land, which they thought was unjustly and improperly under the domain of Muslim powers. And so I think that what I'm trying to do is to try to understand the past so that I can have a better understanding of the present. I mean, for example, when you go to a doctor, oftentimes a doctor takes a detailed medical history. And that is not just because the doctor is a student of the past. The doctor is trying to understand your present so the doctor can prescribe a detailed treatment plan and a diagnosis. And so that's what I'm trying to do by going back in time in history. So you are also in the process of doing that. You are in in many respects revising what you call the creation uh, myth of of how um, of, of both the settler colonialism and how the American uh, how the United States were formed. All right. So where um, you, you you're going back to the Crusades, but uh, then it we are at at least in, in, in terms of, um, of, I guess, the, the, the saga of what ultimately will be the United States. We're also at the Ottoman Empire in 1450. How, how mm-hmm. does the Ottoman Empire, um, uh, essentially uh, going after Constantinople here, um, w- w- rela- w- where does that lead us from there? <laughs> Well, you have to understand the religious conflict in some ways mirrors, if not was more excessive and more extreme than the ideological conflicts of the 20th century. I'm sure you're familiar, um, I know that you're familiar, for example, with the existential terror that was induced by the rise of fascism in Germany and Italy and Europe. That was an ideological conflict, for example. In 1453, when Muslim powers, the Ottoman Turks, what was then called Constantinople from Christian powers, that induces a kind of existential terror in the Christian powers, particularly Spain. And as the Ottoman Turks begin to move west, it seems as if Spain, which fortunately for its sake faces the Atlantic Ocean, begins to move west as well, because there is a fear that with the Ottomans seizing what becomes Istanbul, that the trade routes to the riches of the East, Persia, India, China, are blocked, and therefore there is a desire to move west to find a new route to India, for example, which is why when Christopher Columbus, sponsored by Spain, bumps into the Americas, he calls the indigenous inhabitants Indians, and that's why even today 
the Caribbean nations oftentimes are referred to as the West Indies, for example. And that process in, instigated by Columbus helps to bring millions across the Atlantic, ultimately, not only Europeans, but also Africans, to create this new regime that we are now faced with in North America. So um, uh, that that begins the um, the uh, I guess the, um, uh, the 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 process, as it were, uh, and you and you say that 1492 was a a hinge uh, moment for Western U- Europe. Well, that's correct. It's not only Columbus, but it's also that the Spanish, or what we call the Spanish, finally outs Muslim control of the Iberian Peninsula. Recall the Muslim powers that basically controlled Spain for hundreds of years up until 1492. And it's also in 1492 that you see that the Spanish expelled the Jewish population, the Sephardim, which then goes on, to, they go on to play a major role with regard to the story that I tell. And in fact, you can't understand the answer to the question I posed at the top, which is why we're sitting here speaking English and not Spanish in light of the fact that Spain had the first mover's advantage without understanding religious conflict. Uh, That is to say, the Protestant Reformation instigated by Martin Luther in 1517 sweeps into England, as we know, in the 1530s, which helps to induce a round of religious conflict, murderous religious conflict. England wants its role at the table in the Americas, but unlike Spain, which demanded a religious qualification for settlement, that is to say you had to be Catholic in order to be a settler in the Spanish colonies in the Americas, the scrappy underdog that was England did not take that religious route. It moved instead to pan-Europeanism, and which allowed it to incorporate the Sephardim in terms of settlers. And that's even more striking in light of the fact that England itself had expelled this Jewish population for the most part in 1291, 200 years before the Spanish did. It turns out that the English route, that is to say this route of pan-Europeanism, which morphs into this new identity or relatively new, new identity that's called whiteness, is the winning ticket, which then manages to outstrip Spanish religious sectarianism and allows England to move into what it calls Virginia by 1607, thereby inaugurating a process that leads to the United States by, say, 1776. Okay, and 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 the, I'm, and I really want to sort of like um, uh, walk through what you just said uh, uh, slowly because this is um, I, I find this so fascinating, and it is it tells us so much about um, the the questions of the relationship between. Uh, it, it seems to me racism and capitalism and obviously, you know, white supremacy and, and, and settler colonialism. What, what was it? So in, in some way, what I am gathering from your work is that what's happening at that time, it's almost like water will find its lowest, you know, the lowest point. And it, it like, there is no, it's not so much a plan here, but it's, it's, it's just a constant improvisation to achieve an end goal. And that, that uh, England never set out to be, uh, I guess, more ecumenical, but it was just like, th- th- we, need, w- we need bodies. We need some power here. And we can't, we can't do it under a religious, if, if the litmus test is religious, we're, we're going to lose this, this battle with Spain. Well, in fact, you're using the term improvisation that I use. I also use the term contingencies. That is to say that what unfolds is not necessarily based upon an architectural blueprint by some around the table in London. In many ways, it's just adapting to circumstances. For example, when the Spanish move into what they call St. Augustine, Florida in 1565, and St. Augustine, Florida, as you know, builds itself as the longest continuously settled uh, urban node in North America, there is a religious qualification. But what happens is that they not only have enslaved Africans, 
they also, because they have a religious qualification, if you were an African who professed Catholicism, you could be a conquistador. And for example, in Cuba, uh, which is also a settlement of Spain, as you well know, uh, there historically were not only black conquistadors, there was a larger so-called free Negro population, much larger uh, proportionally than had ever existed in the North American settlements dominated by London. But London had a problem, as noted, because there weren't enough Protestants to go around, so they adapt to this pan-Europeanism. Spain, when London moves into what it calls Virginia in 1607, wants to do something about it. It, it wants to move north to oust and fight the English to oust them from Virginia, but they're tied down in Florida, uh, fighting this alliance between Native Americans and Africans. And because they have this idea of religious sectarianism, they're not, unlike the English, they're not able to attract the Jewish population, the Protestant population, et cetera. As a matter of fact, because of the Inquisition, which is a process inaugurated in Spain and accelerates post-1492. If you wind up in Florida and say that you're Jewish and say that you're Protestant, you're likely to be tortured at best, decapitated at worst. And so we have, um, obviously, I mean, uh, I guess centuries upon centuries of, of, of examples of slavery up until this point. But it had been a function of religiosity for the most part, as opposed to racial slavery, which was a, um, I guess, an innovation. Well, I guess that's one way to put it. I mean, keep in mind that the other major power, the Ottoman Turks, were equal opportunity enslavers. They enslaved Africans, to be sure, but they also enslaved Europeans. Is the history of Albania and Bosnia and Kosovo and Bulgaria and Macedonia tend to suggest. The Spanish, of course, enslaved countless numbers of indigenous people. They enslaved Africans. But for hundreds of years, for, de for, excuse me, for decades, they also enslaved people uh, that we would call Filipinos. Recall that it was in the 1500s that the Spanish arrived in this Pacific archipelago that was named after King Philip, speaking of the Philippines. And from that point forward, they began to drag Filipinos across the Pacific uh, to Mexico. It was the, quote, innovation, unquote, uh, of London to a certain extent to focus like a laser beam with regard to enslaving Africans. Although, of course, they did enslave indigenous populations too when they were not ousting them altogether and expelling them uh, from their land and selling them into slave markets as far away as North Africa or even to slave markets in Turkey. Because one of the reasons we're sitting here speaking English is that the English brokered an alliance with the Muslims particularly with the Ottoman Turks and to a certain degree with the Moroccans. And they had a mutual antagonist in Catholic Spain. The enemy of my enemy is my friend, of course, is still a staple of international diplomacy. And it was that alliance that helped to weaken Spain, that helped to propel England forward. And in fact, as I tell the story, a turning point in the precipitous decline of Africa comes when the English and the Moroccans join together to wage war on the Shanghai Empire in what is now today's Mali, which interestingly enough is also a Muslim power as well, but obviously that did not count for much. And the destabilization of this relatively strong state in the heart of Africa has negative knock-on effects, ricocheting and cascading as far south as today's Nigeria, softening up West Africa for the onrushing African slave trade in which the English play a primary and paramount role. And, and what, I mean, obviously um, people enslave uh, other people for free labor, but what was the, what, like, what were the, the needs um, and what was the uh, compulsion, I guess? I mean, I, you know, I mean, what is it that, that is driving the, the both the expansion 
um, and the, and the trade, is it just simply a desire to have more goods? Is there domestic pressures that exist in, uh, the various uh, European, uh, I guess, kingdoms, um, at that time. And, and, and what was their varied, the, the varied uses of slavery at that time? Well, I think that accumulation of wealth is, is the easy answer to your question. But of course, there are layers and additions that are added subsequently. In my book on the 17th century, I talk about how when the English arrived in Barbados in the 1600s, initially, when they're bringing Africans across the Atlantic, supposedly, this was done because they were going to introduce them to Christianity. And for the longest, they're referred to as heathens and non-Christians. And at a certain point, that shifts, and they're referred to as an inferior being, that is to say, referred to as, as Black. But I think that it's important to point out that the African slave trade is one of the most profitable enterprises known to humankind. You can invest $1 and get $1,700 back. I dare say that there are some, even today, who might sell their firstborn for a 1,700% profit. This also had other spinoff effects. That is to say, in order to bring European settlers across the Atlantic and enslaved Africans across the Atlantic, that presupposes ships, which presupposes a shipbuilding industry, presupposes the creation of a working class in England itself that has wages that then can use those pounds to buy food, to buy other products, which then leads to production of those goods as well. It also presupposes the existence of an insurance industry because oftentimes Africans did not willingly cross the Atlantic. They rebelled on ships, and therefore investors could suffer a loss of where insurance comes in. And as any investor in the insurance industry uh, can tell you, even today, uh, insurance industry is a major way to generate profit because, of course, part of the trick is not to pay back after the person who's paid the premium, after they come to you with a claim. And so then this creates a, a pool of capital that, that then go, could go into banking, and then the banks could lend out money to other spinoff industries as well. And so it creates, from London's point of view, a virtuous circle leading to a tremendous explosion and expansion of wealth. But at the same time, of course, it creates countless misery, uh, not least for those who are enslaved. And so, I mean, we're, the, we're, we're talking about nascent capitalism here, driving the, I mean, the, the expansion on some level. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. We are. I mean, and, 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 and it, it, it's, 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 it's fair to say that England is paramount in terms of this process. It allows the creation of the British Empire, where the sun never sets. Uh, that is to say, London develop, eventually develops this empire that spans the globe, with India in some ways being the crown jewel of the British Empire. But keep in mind that before the development of India as the crown jewel of the empire, in the middle part of the 1700s, perhaps the most profitable part of the British Empire, even more profitable than its settlements in North America, were the Caribbean colonies, particularly Jamaica, Barbados, and Tiga, where you had the production of these cash crops like sugar, uh, sugar was not only used to sweeten your tea, using sugar was seen as a mark of sophist sophistication as well. Some even saw it as a miracle drug. And the wealth that was generated by sugar is still rather mind boggling in retrospect. Uh, some of the titans of the sugar plantations in Jamaica, Barbados, et cetera, uh, had a net worth that in some ways was larger than any of their compatriots in London itself, not to mention in the settlements of North America that eventuate in the creation of the United States of America. So um, we have this, we have uh, this nascent uh, capitalist system that requires uh, the, that not only requires 
um, free labor, but commodifies the free labor and, uh, and builds a whole industry around the process of providing free labor. Um, and, and so at what point, I mean, so we get to, um, we're, we're, we're in the United States, the, the British have decided that <clears throat> they cannot get the bodies they need of, of free men, I guess, to fight the Spanish, unless they basically say, you know, we're more, uh, we're, we're more ecumenical. Um, and, and therefore to justify slavery, they can't use uh, religion in the way that it has been in the past to justify slavery. Right. Um, and so they develop this construct of, of race, which is a function of, of, everybody who's coming from Europe is one thing. And then everybody who's not is another thing. Well, yes. And you need to see this once again, as a kind of improvisation, number one. Secondly, you need to see it as a kind of put in the cinematic terms as a slow motion dissolve, as opposed to a snapshot, for example, it's an elongated process, but I, I think that it also carries lessons for today. I mean, for example, uh, when you have the development of the U.S. Constitution and the First Amendment guaranteeing freedom of religion, uh, even today, if you go into many classrooms, absent the pandemic, you would see professors and listen to professors talking about how this was a product of the European Enlightenment and how it represented in the, the minds of men, because we're talking about mostly men, a step forward in terms of their consciousness. I tend to see it as an improvisation, that is to say that London had to, and the settlers following London had to move away from religious sectarianism because it was not a useful tool to build a powerful state. And I think that carries implications for today, because uh, I'm, now that we've had the decades, if not centuries, of development of the United States of America, it doesn't surprise me, at least, that within the, with regard to the recent Supreme Court term, you've had a kind of backsliding uh, with regard to religious sectarianism, with regard to the Supreme Court issuing decisions that give Christian organizations uh, more authority to high and fire people on the basis of religion, uh, giving Christian entities based on their theology, the right to grant or not grant, or even mention whether women should have the right to contraceptive services pursuant to what we call Obamacare. And I think if, if I may be so uh, modest, if you like, that the point I'm putting forward that these are not necessarily these philosophical uh, reforms as much as they're reforms that are designed to propel and perpetuate a certain kind of settler colonialism, a certain kind of way of confronting rebellious Africans, confronting rebellious indigenous populations. I think that the latter is a sounder way to understand U.S. history and to understand what's happening today. So in other words, it's, it's a, a pragmatic decision uh, made by people who still have this agenda of uh, accumulating wealth and power. Um, and they're just looking around and seeing what they, what they have in their quiver at any given point. And there are, over time, what's in that quiver uh, changes and sometimes returns to the mean. I mean, I, I feel like we could notice that in the context of, you know, uh, in, 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 in our modern era, when we lose the, um, the, the Soviet threat, uh, we develop new threats uh, that uh, appear. When, uh, and, and down to, like, you know, when the Republican Party loses homophobia as an uh, as electoral tool, it, uh, it becomes more focused on transphobia or, um, or, uh, or other issues. Uh, because it's just sort of searching for a, an arrow in its quiver that will function in the same way as the last arrow that no longer is effective. Well, it's interesting that you mentioned that because I wasted a lot of time yesterday uh, watching on C-SPAN this presentation from the Trump Hotel in Washington uh, 
by the House, the House Freedom Caucus. I'm sure you're familiar with the yes. right wingers uh, in Congress in a joint symposium with the Liberty University of Mr. Falwell. And it was all focused on China. And it was a fire breathing exercise. And uh, I think it's fair to say, particularly after watching Michael Pompeo, the U.S. Secretary of State speech, uh, not coincidentally at the Nixon Library in Yorba Linda, California, just a few days ago, where he basically signaled not only the launch of a new Cold War against China, but in some ways, an effort at regime change with regard to China, that it's apparent that Washington has found a new enemy, uh, which then will help to generate ever larger Pentagon budgets. It will help to focus the money. And interestingly enough, one of their major themes at the Freedom Caucus was that the Black Lives Matter protests from the Atlantic to the Pacific are basically sponsored by the Chinese Communist Party. I kid you not. And so this will also be a way to help to discredit <laughs> these protests because supposedly they're tied to the newest foreign antagonist of the United States of America. And so it goes. That's funny. I have to say, um, I mean, I don't, I, my sense is, is that the China thing is not quite as new as that. I think there is a long lineage. Uh, I, I, I recall in when I first started doing radio, we interviewed Gary Hart who had that. I think you'll recall this, that he, and I think it was Rudman, had a um, were tasked at, at the um, at the beginning of the of this century uh, to create a panel on the 21st century um, security risks to the United States of America. And, and, and Hart had told me this story where they sat around a big table. There was 25 of them or so. Uh, they had invited people in. They went through each person. What are the greatest threats to the United States? Um, maybe one or two people said uh, climate change. But for the most part, they all said uh, non-state actors, um, you know, uh, potentially uh, attacking the United States. This was in literally, I think, months uh, before uh, 9-11. And one person said China. And everybody sort of uh, dismissed that person. Uh, and they met again three or four months later, I guess, to sort of like, you know, having uh, digested their first meeting, went around the whole thing. Again, that one person again said China. Uh, and uh, everybody sort of dismissed it. And uh, that person never came back to any of the meetings. And <laughs> my understanding is that person was Lynn Cheney. And so um, uh, that, you know, the, it was out there. I mean, I, I think those Project for a New American Century people had um, had uh, some of those neocons had been thinking about China for a long time in terms of, you know, once the uh, once the, the, the wall fell. But we are. Um, we're a bit of far afield. I want to go back to that, uh, to go back four or 500 years um, okay. to the, I, I'm, I'm also fascinated, like the, why were the British uh, in need of the Sephardic Jews? Was that, was that, um, I mean, was that because they, there was the, the, the Jews going into the diaspora provided uh, a, a sort of a, a pre-existing network in which to to get goods to um, uh, to the colonies, or, or what was that? Well, first of all, if you look at the Jewish population of the Iberian Peninsula, even though they were ostensibly expelled by Spain and also Portugal, I should add, in the late 1400s, there is evidence to suggest that they may even been on the boat with Columbus. There's evidence to suggest that when the Spanish from their perch in what we now call Mexico began to send settlers northward to what we now call New Mexico, that leading the formations, leading the troops and the settlers were actually so-called crypto Jews or new Christians, conversos to use those various terms. Now, with regard to the English, and also the Dutch, because in some ways the Dutch were a stalking horse for London. In some ways, the Dutch, who were also predominantly Protestant, uh, were ahead of England in terms of developing some of these forces we're talking about. Uh, for example, pan-Europeanism, uh, for example, capitalism, uh, for, exa for example, republicanism. Uh, 
And when the Sephardim were expelled, they dispersed all over the place. And so when England began to make their overtures to this population, they had what were called these diaspora networks. You know, they're compatriots, they're co-religionists in the four corners of the world who could supply a trading routes, trading intelligence, commercial intelligence, etc. cetera. Uh, London found that to be quite useful. And as you know, a turning point in terms of the Jewish population moving to North America comes in the middle part of the 17th century, that is to say the 1650s, when Oliver Cromwell, who temporarily had dislodged the monarch and had, had led to the beheading of the monarch, uh, basically makes a kind of pact with the uh, Jewish community, uh, which then blossomed after London out the Dutch from Manhattan in 1664. And even before then, you had uh, a Jewish population moving into Manhattan, despite a kind of anti-Semitism by uh, Peter Stuyvesant and other Dutch leaders. And so in some and in capsule, that's how the Sephardim figure into London's calculations. Um, I, I want to just also go through that process of the, I mean, and, and, and my, my sense is from, from what you've written is that it's, you know, there's obviously, there's no one sitting in a room going, what we need to do is um, create this, um, these racial divisions as a way of, of, of greasing the wheels uh, in uh, slavery, uh, you know, so that we can we can uh, diminish the moral compunctions and we can uh, commodify these uh, people. And um, but how did that process work? I mean, once there was a sort of a a um, I guess a sense in England that look, we can't be we can't sectarianism is just not going to work for us. <laughs> Cause we need these people. So like where, where does the steps go from there? Or is it just simply looking around going like, Oh, wait a second there, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm looking, uh, across the, uh, the Mediterranean. And I realize like, Oh, I, I see a distinction that is not going to get caught up in religion. I mean, how does that happen? Well, first of all, one of the things you learn graduate school in history, although it's not always observed, is that history is argument without end. Now, I'm telling one story. Let, let us say that magically and mysteriously uh, tomorrow, a bunch of letters of Oliver Cromwell arises in London, where he says specifically something that contradicts my story about improvisation and contingency. That will lead to a new story uh, being written. But in any case, as of now, this is my story and I'm sticking to it because this is what the evidence tends to suggest, which is that London is the scrappy underdog. It does not have many options in terms of getting a place at the banquet of colonialism since Spain has the first mover's advantage. And at the same time, as noted, it makes sense for London to ally with the Sephardim who, needless to say, many of them are quite bitter uh, about what befell them when they were subjected to the Inquisition and expelled altogether. And a similar process happens to the Muslims in Spain as well. Uh, They're subjected to the Inquisition by the early 1600s. They're expelled altogether from Spain, but they're just across the Mediterranean uh, from Muslim powers, in including Morocco. And so it doesn't take uh, some sort of uh, savant uh, of diplomacy in London to figure out who you should align with. And interestingly enough, uh, this kind of thinking is echoed and mirrored in the plays of Shakespeare uh, with regard to his Othello character, uh, with regard to what many have pointed out to his favorable portrayals and depictions of Muslims, because this was the line that was coming from London at that particular moment in history. So what was the, were, were there foundation? I mean, like for me, I, I, it, it seems easier for me to see uh, 
where there would be foundations for um, religious, uh, where there would be uh, foundations for sectarianism, right? Um, and uh, that, you know, this is the way that kings would justify their rule for centuries. God and our perception of, of what God is has, has deemed me, uh, you know, the ruler and everything that you get is a function of what that God has done. And so, you know, society is constructed in such a way where the authority of religion holds. Where does it, what was, what is your sense of, of what provided that foundation for um, seeing, you know, for the construct of, of race? Well, as I tell the story, one of the problems dealing with race and racism is that, in my estimation, it has religious roots. And th this is not necessarily my opinion. I think a scholarly consensus is developing. Uh, for example, one scholar who I quote suggests that lynching, this barbaric practice of the late 19th century, early 20th century, first few decades of 20th century in the United States, particularly in Dixie, uh, where black men in particular are, are hung from trees and hundreds, perhaps thousands, a mass. Sometimes they're burning crosses. This scholar tends to see lynching as, as a kind of quasi-religious process. And one of the reasons I go back to KKK would burn crosses. With regard, I mean, the KKK would burn say, crosses. Say that again. Yeah, the KKK would burn yeah, crosses. Exactly. Well, it's part of this, this Christian KKK, of course, thought that it was a Christian organization. Uh, in their rhetoric, in their verbiage, they, they had many references to what they called uh, Anglo-Saxonism. And, and, and in fact, in their second iteration around World War I, about 100 years ago, uh, they even revived uh, the religious wars. Uh, they proudly proclaimed that they were Protestants. They harassed Catholics except for Louisiana, where you had uh, a white majority, and particularly Southern Louisiana, which was predominantly Catholic. But in Northern Louisiana, up around Shreveport, where it was predominantly Protestant, <laughs> they tended to be anti-Catholic. And so what I try to suggest is that what, what some would call the sort of othering process, that it, it begins with Muslims. And then keep in mind that when the African slave trade takes off, it initially takes off in areas of Africa that are predominantly Muslim. That is to say, today's Senegal, uh, today's uh, Gambia, uh, for example. And therefore, the Africans who are brought across the Atlantic, it's easy to see them as a kind of religious other, and then it becomes simpler for them to morph into being a so-called inferior racial other. Um. It's it, it's fascinating, and I, I just there's uh, I want to just also tie one other thing in uh, before we go, and I I I, I feel like I, I I could I could talk to you all day, uh, frankly, uh, but um, the there is there there see, there feels like there's a certain symmetry between the idea of of racial oppression being a function in, in this country, anyways. Um, in uh, being a function of of this uh, these uh, what would be perceived from from an American's perspective as like a sort of an international um, you know uh, international machinations as it were and then you know if you come back around to uh, things like you know um, why we rolled back Jim Crow uh, era laws and why we had things like um, the Civil Rights Act and um, was in many respects also sort of a function of our standing internationally. C can you just speak about that, yeah, uh, exactly. about how that works, about that, that relationship between, you know, how much uh, of, of a of, of phenomena and struggle um, is not, which I think often we have, uh, and I am certainly guilty of this, a myopia in seeing it as a domestic phenomena when in fact it is actually a world phenomena. Well, I'm glad you raised that because before I started going back in time, I started as a 20th century historian writing about the civil rights movement and the movement against Jim Crow. 
and now many historians have taken up that mantle, and there is now a historical consensus that suggests that when Jim Crow began to retreat in the 1950s and the 1960s, it was due in no small measure to the pressures of the Cold War, with Washington competing with Moscow for hearts and minds, particularly in resource-rich areas of Africa and the Caribbean, but found that Washington's domestic policy with regard to Jim Crow was a hindrance in that regard, and that creates momentum for the agonizing retreat from Jim Crow. In fact, the State Department files a brief in the Brown versus Board of Education decision, 1954, which marks the, at least the juridical termination of, of Jim Crow, suggesting the point that I just made, that Jim Crow is a hindrance in terms of the retreat, uh, in terms of the execution of U.S. foreign policy. But as you know, uh, that was not a unanimously agreed upon consensus from the Atlantic to the Pacific. You had these riots in Little Rock, Arkansas in 1957, when there was an attempt to desegregate schools, riots in Oxford, Mississippi in 1962, when there was an attempt to have one black student, James Meredith, enter that uh, hollowed institution, a riot in Boston, Massachusetts in the 1970s over desegregation and the so-called busing crisis. In New York in the 1980s, the crisis over desegregation of housing in Yonkers. And so I think that historians, oftentimes, at least some historians, have overestimated the extent to which these changes, these profound changes that had deep historical roots, that is to say, this agonizing retreat from Jim Crow, which has deep roots in the 1500s, the extent to which this was greeted warmly and unanimously. Uh, by masses, uh, I, I think that instead we have to look at it as a movement from below, uh, led by Martin Luther King and his colleagues in the civil rights movement, assisted from uh, forces from above, the U.S. Supreme Court, the U.S. State Department responding to Cold War pressures, et cetera. Is there a, 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 an analog in, in, in today or a lack of an analog? I mean, where is it's our, our we, we, we have a lot of things going on in this country right now um, to what are we are we untethered from that internationalism? I mean, or and to, if we are, is the fact that we're untethered also having implications? I'm, I'm afraid so, and that, that, that's what uh, keeps me up at night. Uh, that is to say, I've, like many, I've been heartened by these post-May 25th, 2020 protests ignited by the killing on camera of George Floyd, uh, which has led to tremendous change in just two months, uh, some symbolic, like the taking down of statutes, and, and some more substantive, like movements to have police only execute duties where a man or woman with a gun is needed and not necessarily execute duties when a social worker would do, like dealing with a mentally challenged or uh, dealing with a neighbor complaining about a noise complaint. There have been tremendous changes, but I'm concerned as, as a historian that I don't necessarily see the international gust in our sails, which worries me because to go back to my watching this Freedom Caucus Symposium, it makes me wary that certain demagogic forces will be able to suggest that in fact, these protests are basically the work and we're just the pawn of a foreign power and therefore need to be discredited, which would therefore lead to repression of this movement, end of story. So, I mean, is that, is that, is it, is it because that, because it's untethered to any type of other international movement that creates a vacuum that is going to be filled? In other words, like, you know, do you need to tie in um, a movement in this country to some other international um, um, a movement as a way of preventing someone else coming in and redefining it as having other roots or, or what is that, is that what you're saying? Well, in part, that's what I'm saying. And I'm also looking at the battlefield. I'm also looking at the fact that uh, Mr. Trump got 63 million votes 
in November 2016. As of today, despite the polls, which many of which were inaccurate in 2016, we can't say decisively that he'll be turned out of office in November 2020. And despite the fact that you have this Black Lives Matter movement, it's a decentralized movement, unlike movements of the past. Even Martin Luther King's movement had a certain kind of centralization through the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, and which he headed, and which, of course, he had lieutenants. There was a centralized body that was plotting strategy. You don't have that sort of thing with the Black Lives Matter movement. And then, number two, it makes it difficult to, to broker alliances abroad. I mean, for example, just a few weeks ago at the United Nations Human Rights Council in Geneva, Switzerland, the African Union introduced a resolution calling for a commission of inquiry into systemic racism in the United States based upon what they saw with regard to George Floyd. But the movement in the United States was basically ignorant of this momentous development, of this momentous outreach by the African Union, the Pan-African transcontinental body uh, headquartered in Ethiopia. And that's one of the reasons, one of the many reasons why the resolution failed. And so that sort of lack of connection, I find quite concerning, because I think that as we try to plot strategy, we have to recognize the nature of the battlefield. And we have to recognize that just like in the 1950s, when you had Brown versus Board of Education, that was not necessarily agreed un with unanimity, uh, certainly not in Little Rock, Arkansas. And I don't think, quite frankly, that some of these changes that are taking place now are not necessarily being greeted with unanimity. Right. And I think that we may be shocked to find a quiet riot at the polls on November 30th, November 3rd, 2020. And, and just to sort of map out like how uh, the, the what the value of 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 that type of international alliance is that if there is domestic support for and an increased sort of like public support for that um, uh, that resolution uh, headed by Ethiopia, you also, it seems to me, it can also go the other way too, where you um, say, you know, if you're concerned about China's expansion, um, you know, you're going to need, um, you know, some connection with Ethiopia, right? I mean, like it, it, China's pouring just <laughs> tremendous amount of money into, um, into Africa. And, and, and uh, I, you know, my understanding is that um, much of the economic development in Ethiopia has been driven by by Chinese investment, and it, it, it you, you there's a there is an opportunity to leverage that um, the I guess the fear of um, of uh, of uh, uh, of an emerging uh, China to to leverage that by saying like you know uh, if you want to develop these relationships in Africa you 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 I mean not unlike during the Jim Crow era you you need to respond to, to their concerns. Well, you know, I, I was thinking of that as I was watching the Freedom Caucus Symposium at the Trump Hotel, because many of the speakers, uh, many of the congressmen who were speaking, there were mostly congressmen who were speaking, including Dan Crenshaw of Texas, Ted Yoho of Florida, et, et cetera, uh, Senator Marsha Blackburn of Tennessee, oh, for example, and Senator Tom Cotton of Arkansas. They kept talking about how it's mandatory for Washington to develop global alliances in order to confront China. And as I was watching that, I was thinking of Mr. Trump's uh, hostility to the European Union, his referring to certain African countries as being no more than f-holes, yep. um, to use that euphemism. And I was wondering how they're going to work out those conflicting and contrasting lines. And I'm not so sure how it's going to work out, how it's going to play out. Well, um, Professor, it is always a, a real uh, pleasure and honor to talk to you. The book is The Dawning of the Apocalypse, The Roots of Slavery, White Supremacy, Settler Colonialism, and Capitalism in the Long 16th Century, which w we should say, uh, you know, for whatever reason, that, that century was particularly long. It ran from the, the mid-1400s to uh, into the uh, 1600s. Uh, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, fascinating stuff. And we will put a link to that book uh, at uh, majority.fm. Thank you for inviting me.